This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about their cultural experiences and influences, the artists that have inspired them from their early years to now, the writers and poets who influence them, the music they listen to and the cultural epiphanies that have marked their lives. And in this episode, it's A Brush With, Julian Opie, an artist with a highly distinctive artistic language. Whether he's working in painting, sculpture or animation, once you know Julian's work, you can instantly spot it. Born in London in 1958, Julian achieved acclaim early in his career. A year after graduating from Goldsmiths College in London in 1982, he was showing with the Listen Gallery, which was then the most avant-garde contemporary gallery in London. Many of the artists showing at the Listen Gallery, like Richard Deacon and Anish Kapoor, were part of the so-called New British Sculpture Movement, with whom Julian was instantly linked. Through the 80s, Julian quickly developed his sculpture from an expressive pop art inspired postmodernity to a spare minimalism. But the simple graphic style and the diversity of media for which Julian is best known began to take concrete shape in the 1990s. The basis of all Julian's work is drawing, through which he attempts to distill the visual experience of seeing everything from people and animals to buildings and cars to their essentials, and by doing so, to explore the very nature of perception. As we'll hear, that language derives from a huge range of artistic influences and a profound curiosity about diverse visual cultures from the ancient past to the present, from Western classical portraiture to Egyptian hieroglyphs and Japanese woodblock prints. But he also responds to the reductive, immediate language of public signage and information boards. Although Julian's art might at first appear to be an urban one, especially if you encounter it in the many forms of public works that he makes, from static sculptures to animated animals and figures, like the walking woman in London's Carnaby Street, he's actually applied it to an enormous range of subjects outside cities, from motorways to farmed fields, coastal scenes and rivers, to, in an exhibition at London's Pitshanger Manor, where we meet, a French village. Indeed, despite being most famous for his depictions of people, from himself to anonymous figures and faces he captures on the streets of towns and cities to commission portraits, not least the album cover Blur the Best Of from 2000, it took a while for representations of people to enter Julian's world of images. So I began by asking him what prompted the late emergence of faces and figures in his work. I don't like to place too much importance on subject matter. There is a tendency with art, I think, that it's read in terms of subject matter, and that's fine, and it's a good way into a work, but that would be like only talking about the words in music, in opera or something. You'd be missing a lot if you saw it in that way. Quite often in opera, you know, the words are really there to kind of carry the music along and to keep your interest throughout various bits of music and to give it a sort of logic, and and I think I use imagery in to a certain degree in the same way if something works for me when I'm drawing a dog the logic can then be transferred maybe to an image of a building or one of the other things that I'm playing around with at the time and so that's what tends to happen is the work kind of bounces back and forth and I like having these different options in my head that allow me to to do these different things and I, there was a point in the 90s, I think, where in 93, I did a big show at the Hayward Gallery, which was sort of a turning point for me, a chance to bring all my work together and see it, not just as a series of works I made in the studio, but really as a kind of an overall sense of what I was wanting to do and had done. There were no people in that exhibition, and I got a lot of flack for that exhibition for all sorts of reasons, particularly, I think, because I was about 34, and it was a one-person show at the Hayward Gallery, which was you know fantastic, but... It, unusual perhaps I didn't exactly take to heart the 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 negative comments about there being no people in it my my response at the time would have been well it was full of people but they were the visitors and therefore I'd made an environment which where where it's a plus that there were visitors in the space I often feel with an exhibition it can feel like an, a minus that there are people in there you kind of wish they'd all go away so you could look at it properly and that's a shame it's better perhaps to make an exhibition where it's a plus that there are people in there. So I started to think, how could I extend the things I was doing to include people? But people are not that easy to draw. 
other things I was drawing at the time were buildings and cars, um, animals. But what I needed was some kind of language that I could approach drawing people with. I couldn't simply sit down and draw them, although I used to do that when I was young and life classes and all that kind of thing. But I felt I needed a, a an existing language that, that I could then manipulate. I don't always do this, but in this case, I consciously looked around for options and I, I work in the Shoreditch area of London, which used to be the great furniture making part of London. And there were a lot of shops there selling parts for furniture. And I knew them quite well. And I went into one and I bought a series of, of door signs depicting people, specifically lavatory door signs. So you get a man and a woman. And I asked the next door neighbor, Diptesh, who runs the news agents, if he would just stand in the street. And I photographed him and I put, I put the image of him over the man and I bent... The, the lines on the computer of, of the drawing of the man to fit him. And lo and behold, there was Dip. It, was, it, it made me laugh, actually. It was, like, it was so much him, even though he only had a black circle for a head. He had no feet, as you remember, the man on the door. Um, and I set about effectively drawing everybody that I could get my hands on. And there are a lot of potential people out there, as, as we know. Um, I don't know how many people I have drawn since then. And I've done all sorts of projects. I've been to other countries and drawn people there. I've drawn ballet dancers. I've drawn people with their clothes on, with their clothes off. I think most notably, I've drawn people who know they're being drawn, who've even asked to be drawn, even paid to be drawn. And I've drawn people who don't know that they're being drawn. And the difference there is quite key. And the exhibition here has three people in the main space, one person outside, and none of them knew that they were going to be drawn um, what I do is I set up a camera somewhere um, in this case on a traffic island in the middle of Old Street and um, with a long zoom lens we just click away I don't even look through the viewfinder I just click 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 as people cross at the zebra crossing and then I'm I'm there with this amazing palette of, of possibilities each person of course is different different hair different clothes different kind of gait sometimes I'll film them as well as photograph them and that allows me to make an animated version of that drawing and there's one of those in this exhibition too can you say something about the picking out of the details because it seems to me this is crucial for like so for instance you might have a group of people and there'll be somebody in the, with very clearly a bag for the supermarket tesco or a super dry bag what dictates which details you pick out well not politics um, although I have been banned on occasion, I'm doing a project for the Paris Metro. They wouldn't allow anyone smoking. They wouldn't allow anybody with a bicycle because you're not allowed bicycles in the underground. How literal is that? <laughs> Good job I didn't want to draw a horse uh, as well. <laughs> I did a project in Hong Kong and they didn't want any logos because they also had clients who were, let's say, Adidas. So they don't want Nike, you know, that kind of thing. You bump into this quite a lot. As soon as you start to draw people in particular, you bump into these kind of discussions. But that's not really how I make those decisions. I try to avoid that kind of approach. The decisions are much more to do with about uh, good drawing. And when I say good, I don't mean that I'm a good drawer. I mean that I'm concerned to try to make a good drawing. And if that includes using the little uh, Nike tick or a little Uniqlo square, then that can help the drawing, so I would use that. At the moment, the way I'm drawing doesn't include even the necks, let alone um, any kind of branding on their clothes. But I have at times been drawing people where you can see their shoelaces. It all depends on how I want to approach that particular project. I was drawing some running people, joggers in the park, and it seemed like that part of their whole presence, uniqueness, was the kind of branding on the clothes and also the movement of their shoelaces flapping in as they ran. And so it would have been a shame to cut all of that out. So I included it. At the moment, I, I really want just a sense of, you know, when you're walking down the street and people flash past you, if you were asked later in a lineup, you know, what were they wearing? What color was their hair? You might not remember very much. You'd remember a few key things, perhaps, and it's it's that kind of key. Was did she have a headscarf on, and was it were his sleeves rolled up? Um, was he wearing was she wearing blue or or yellow? That that's all that's necessary in a way to to evoke their presence. It depends, really, to, to answer your question. It depends on the drawing. Yeah, I'm really interested in the relationship between photography and drawing because, as you say, you set up conditions in which you take photographs and then you make drawings. How kind of linear is that process? How much does it vary? I always try to steer people away from the idea that these are based on photographs, partly because of my age. When I was growing up, 
if you based your work on a photograph, you were cheating. Just like my father-in-law once said, um, you're not allowed to make art with a biro. <laughs> um, or at least he thought you weren't allowed to make art with a biro, that there was a rule out there somehow that that was not an artistic um, approach or felt tips, let's say. But of course you are. And a photograph, I, I, I tend to think of, you know, my, my phone here that's got a pretty good camera, actually better than a, a, an old SLR, really, more like a mirror. And what that allows me to do is to go out into Old Street roundabout and set up a, a series of mirrors that, that allows me to take the images of what I'm seeing all the way back into my studio. And, in, you know, in fact, artists used to do that. They build pinhole cameras or set up mirrors so that they could then project uh, the image to where they wanted it. And that allows me then to have that image in front of me on my desk, actually on the computer screen, and I, I draw with a big drawing pad and a pen. It allows me to, to hold still time and to have that image in front of me. I don't actually ever print a photograph. I don't have any photographs. Um, who does these days anyway? So I, I think that the, I'd like to think that the drawing is based on the person, on the reality, on the situation that I've seen. And I generally avoid using anybody else's photographs unless there's absolutely no other way of dealing with the situation. And I've never really exhibited any photographs. I don't know how to deal with photographs in terms of art. They're, they're too real. It's the same with recordings, I've found. I've tried to make some artworks using recordings, and I, I, I do. There may be one in this show as well. But it's very difficult to use a recording of something real, like a voice, for instance, because you can't shake its sense of reality. And as soon as you've got reality, you've got history, because it's not real now. You know it's not. It's a recording, like what you're listening to now. And that that happened not now where you are in the room, it happened some, somewhere else, so you're excluded. So there's a very different psychological dynamic, I think, between the exclusion of a photograph and the presence of, an, of a drawing and an artwork, which doesn't have to have that sense of history. It, 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 all your work, to a certain extent, engages with representations of reality, right? Because, for instance, we're in Pitsanger and downstairs, there is this evocation of a French village. But we know we're not in that yes, specific French yes. village, but you're picking out details, you're evoking a space. And so to a certain extent, do you, do you feel that exact point in that sort of process of depicting realities where you need to find the kind of sweet spot, if you will? Insofar as I think I understand your question, yes, that, that is true. What I want to do is to create a situation in the gallery that is a real situation, not a memory, not a reference to something else or somewhere else or some other time. Um, I want... To, that while you're actually in there, one is engaged in this visual uh, play and, and moment. So that definitely there are references. You know, we all need references in order to know what we're looking at. I mean, there are stories of people who've never been able to see and they get their eyesight back and it takes them a month at least, uh, Oliver Sacks, right, um, <laughs> to learn how to actually make any sense out of the dancing lights in front of their eyes. And it's as babies, that I understand by reading that, that, that you learn how to take all of that dancing lights, which are actually upside down on your retina, and make some kind of sense as to what it is that you're actually looking at. And so it, it's that process of, of making sense and, and understanding things that's important to me. Let's turn to the questions that we ask all the artists now. So uh, who was the first artist whose work you loved? Um, I remember my father was an economist, and I don't know why he decided to do this, but at one point he gave us all every coin and note in the realm, maybe in order to think about money as a, as a thing rather than just as an abstract notion. Um, and this was pre-decimal, so I suppose I would have had a penny and a fapenny piece remember them no you don't <laughs> no one here does <laughs> um they were nice they were they weren't hexagonal they were a bit like the present pound coin i think although no one even has any money anymore <laughs> right but it added up to a fair amount and we were we were given this to do whatever we wanted with which was pretty unusual and i went out and i bought a book on egon sheila um, i lived in oxford there was blackwell's bookshop i think um, which had a nice art section and my parents were furious uh, my my dad, my dad was bless him, was was furious. Um, I remember he was often furious. To be, to be fair, but uh, I think he thought that it was impulsive, 
and silly to spend it all at once so quickly. And, and he had a point in a way. I didn't really know who Egon Schiele was. I'd just spent some time in Blackwell's bookshop and I liked the look of it. It, it appealed to me, as it does to a lot of people and particularly younger people, I think. There's something there in that work that appeals a lot to, to younger people. I still like his work. I wouldn't say it felt very central to me at the moment, but I could go on for hours if we went on from that moment <laughs> onwards. I remember I, I did an interview for Goldsmiths College, as, as one has to, to get, get to art school. And in the panel, they asked me why my work was so eclectic. And I didn't know the meaning of the word eclectic, so I had to fluff my answer quickly. I don't know if eclectic means kind of copying, looking at other things. I hope what I said in, in reply was not defensive, which I think perhaps the normal response would have been, oh, no, 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 it's not. I'm not copying anybody. Um, this was the 80s. It was postmodernism, punk rock. I think my general feeling was, yeah, I'll copy anything and everything because I you know, anything I love out there is, is free game. And I don't have a style. People used to ask when you went to art school, oh, what style do you work in? <laughs> Um, they don't ask that anymore, but they used to ask that. And I didn't like that idea that you had to kind of somehow pick some kind of style and that's what you were. Style seemed like something that you could play with, like color. So my range of interest was great. I didn't know that much. I studied art history and about early Renaissance painting. So I looked at a lot of that. I was madly in love with Monet and Manet and Picasso, as everybody was. But I didn't much know that there was any contemporary art. I think I remember I'd never been to see an exhibition of... Actually, that's not entirely true. Nick Sorota used to run the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford. And I remember seeing a Sol Lewitt show there, which blew me away when I must have been 18 or something like that. But I didn't really think that there were modern artists around or that you could make a living making art. I think art students now are much more savvy and they go to art openings and know about the art world and so on. But... I, it wasn't really until some of my teachers at art school suggested that it, you could actually live as an artist and do art as a job that I began to think in those terms. Um, and at that stage, I, be, I began to know in London, we used to go to openings every week and every night even and, and get to know other artists. And I began to learn about minimalism and conceptual art. And this is the late 70s, early 80s. So which historical artist do you turn to the most today? Well, that's a rolling smorgasbord. <laughs> Can you have a rolling one? Yeah, I think so. I'm always on the lookout anywhere for anything, you know, whether it's a new material or um, a new visual experience. I was looking at galvanized um, eye beams on the way in today on, in taxis, the way they shine in the, this bright sun that we're having at the moment. Um, and I just made some galvanized eye beam work in Valencia. So I'm, I'm always on the lookout for, for new things. Um, and in the same way, if I see any art, recently I got a poster brochure from a museum in Wolfsburg. On the cover, it had a, an artist's work. And I was just like completely furious, really, because it was so good. And it was so something that I felt that if I had thought about it first, I could have got there. Not re It wouldn't have been the same what I had done, but it would have somehow... Got, and I love that feeling. I love that feeling of being outpaced and, and admiring something because so often one's like dismissive and feeling annoyed by other, other art. And so I, I set about finding out who that artist was and I actually bought like six of them. Um, she's really great. She's called Gary Gill, um, an Indian artist who did the Indian pavilion at the Venice Biennale. And she, what she does is ask people in a, a small South Indian village who have, who have festivals every year and they make papier-mâché masks of, of, of gods, I think, if I remember rightly, and, and go around wearing these masks. And she asked them to make masks of, of themselves and, and the other people in the village and then to go about their daily lives with the mask on. And then she photographed them. They're wonderful if you get a chance to, to look them up. And likewise, both with um, art from the past and art from the present, I'm, I'm always on the lookout. Um, I did actually apply to Sussex University to study anthropology, and that was really because my father wanted me to, to do something sensible. But I, did, I was interested. Um, I did get a place. I just never went. went to art school instead. And that way of looking at the world and looking at life has always seemed, made sense to me. I don't listen to the news and I don't read newspapers. My father used to get five a day and I kind of left it to him and my elder brother to know about the contemporary political world. But what I do do is I read a lot about early humans. And, and one says early humans, but actually that's like most humans. 
and certainly most of the time of humans. Um, so on my desk where I work, I have a collection of Homo erectus hand tools, for instance, stone, stone age hand axes, um, which are amazing, beautifully drawn teardrops made of, made of flint and, um, and other kinds of stone. Um, I wouldn't be able to tell you how they have directly inspired me, just that I think that they're very beautiful and simple drawings. But as I, as I learn more about them, maybe I'll, I'll carry on and I'll start reading about um, some other period of, of the world and start learning about art from there. And I've, I've found that this is like a very exciting and interesting way of, of educating myself, really. At the moment, I'm reading about the Natufians. Have you ever come across that Natufians? No. I, don't want to mean, I don't mean to sound like those people who've read a bit and know everything. I don't know anything, really. And I certainly wasn't educated, but I do like reading, as I said. And then the Natufians were around for one and a half thousand years, just before, really, agriculture started. And they seemed like a really fantastic a way of, of life. It was very non-hierarchical. People didn't seem to have, like, rich people and poor people. Their villages were very evenly spaced out and there are some pieces of art left from there and I've been looking at quite a lot at, at them. Um, in terms of works that I've recently really learnt a lot from and actually used some of the tricks from I would say that the art that that's most true of would be Egyptian art. Um, I look a lot at Egyptian art. I went to Egypt recently and spent a fantastic week just going every single day to the Cairo Museum and checking out every single object um, photographing nearly all of them, although you only have to buy a little license to be able to photograph them, and uh, and and coming home and, and studying them. I also went out to the pyramids, and it's empty at the moment, so I encourage you to go now. The tombs, as you can look at them for ages with no one else there, and the way that they depict the world, the the, the methods and techniques that they use, I've learned a lot from. And um, if you could be bothered and looked at my website or some of the shows, you'd see some of those techniques kind of transferred into modern materials and, and modern things to draw. How directly is your work inspired by hieroglyphics? Because it's often mentioned in texts about your work. And it's a useful way of talking about the work, I find. I'm never quite sure how much the things that I do are influenced by the things that I look at in terms of other art. Obviously, everything I do is influenced by what I look at. But uh, in terms of, of the other art that I sometimes collect and, and, and often look at, Sometimes I feel like it's influenced. Sometimes I'm stuck and I walk around my studio looking at some of these things, looking for an answer. And it might be a direct answer or just a kind of sense of an answer of what I feel succeeded for them. But sometimes I'm collecting it because I'm already done that work. I've done that work myself and it reminds me of Assyrian wall carvings. And therefore, I really get into Assyrian wall carvings. But it wasn't them that told me to do what I'm doing. It was more that what I'm doing gave me a way of understanding what I'm looking at. It can work both ways. And there's another way in which it works. For instance, I, I'm sure you must have had the experience of walking into a, a big, famous, old art museum. And on the walls, you see a lot of rectangles that are golden. And inside those golden rectangles are brown pieces of canvas. And what you've got is a room full of paintings that are usually portraits. And that would be pretty much the case through from, the, say, the 16th century through to the 19th. All those rooms, one after the other that you're going to walk through, you're going to see the same set of brown rectangles with golden. And I love them. I could, I could take any amount of those. And, and I, I love the, the feeling of the room as you walk in with these brown rectangles. If you combine that with a sense of what I'm trying to make downstairs, of an exhibition that's got these paintings on the wall, that's got these statues uh, on the floor I'm referring to that experience that we generally share of seeing art of of looking at art so there are three ways then I'm learning from art I'm looking at it because I've already learned about it through my own work and it then makes me look at other work and I'm also referring to it because it, I'm an artist and if you come to an art exhibition you're kind of expecting to see art so it's a very good starting point in a way to have that communication with people yeah you came here you were expecting art here you are. here's a statue here's a painting you know we've already got a conversation going and that's also true I think of work out on the street and I, one of the things I love about London is that it's peopled with statues you know very often 19th century but sometimes earlier and these these amazing dark brown bronze people if you go to Buckingham Palace and that incredible statue out the front it's got these a giant white um, Queen Victoria and then there's a golden figure on the top and then bronzed muscular people 
people in the world on the four corners they're they're amazing things and they they people our town and they make this kind of bridge between humans and architecture which you know the romans used to do and the greeks used to do and the egyptians used to do it's a very human thing to do to have these kind of images and statues of people out there and i play off that a lot i think in the work and that's a very long answer sorry <laughs> It's absolutely fine. I wanted to ask you a bit about, about particularly about Japanese prints, because obviously I think these have been among the most consistent reference points in your work, and you collect them, and you've been involved in exhibitions, for instance, for Yoshige and Utamaro. Can you tell me about that connection, and again, how directly are you conscious of that of that sort of to and fro with those works? First of all, I I just love them. You know, the first time I saw them, I was blown away. I remember being in Japan and seeing an exhibition of Utamaro, and it sounds pathetic and wet, but I actually felt quite tearful just as quite how beautiful they are. They're just stunning um, to be able to uh, to evoke so much sense of presence and existence by this this fluid line, which is actually cut from wood, not by Utamaro um, or Hiroshige. Of course, they, they worked as a team with very skilled uh, wood carvers, but still uh, am- amazing. They obviously made sense to me in particular, given the way that I draw. I've always drawn using a line from the time that I was a teenager. It always seemed to me a a very obvious, sensible and satisfying process to have my hand on a piece of paper holding a pencil or a felt tip pen or a biro and to look at the world and to just allow that process to flow. And it's something that I can do. Uh, It seems to come naturally. I can move my hand and I can look at your face. And when I look down at the piece of paper, pretty much you'll be there. Um, and that's that always was a good party trick when you're a teenager. It used to impress people, and it 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 felt real to me somehow. It felt like it made sense in some sense of of how we look at the world. We 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 think we're in the world. We seem to be, but all we've got really are our senses telling us that we're here. So we're dealing with with what we believe to be outside that's shared, but actually we were all actually just taking in a lot of information and processing it. And drawing somehow seems to me sets itself right in the middle of that process of looking, seeing, receiving and putting back out again. You know, how amazing, not just to take it all in. I often feel on holiday a little lost um, as a tourist. Like, what are you supposed to do with all of this? But artists are blessed because as a tourist, it's quite exhausting, isn't it? Like just taking in loads and loads of information. Most people's reaction to that is to take a photograph because that way you somehow can do something with it. And I'm really interested by the way people photograph things and what they photograph. You see people going around exhibitions now, photographing every single piece of work, quite often backwards, so that they got themselves in front of the artwork, and then presumably sending them out too. And that's that's a very interesting engagement with something. And I understand it. I'm not negative about it, although it does have its limitations. But as an artist, you have the option of doing is actually using that stuff. You know, if you see a pyramid, what do you do with that amazing moment when you first see a pyramid? I can do something with it, and and I'm I'm blessed with that. I really value that, and I I spent my life kind of going through that process of doing something with it. So back to Utamar and Hiroshige, they draw with this this sinuous and simple black line, largely, although to differing degrees they use color, because they used vegetable dyes. A lot of the colour has gone, particularly Utamara, who's 18th century, who's famous for painting, drawing, uh, printing, women's faces, really. Sometimes men, sometimes actors, but but his main oeuvre are, are so-called beautiful women. And you'll, you'll definitely know them. You'll have seen them either in museums or on coffee cups or in, on a Japanese restaurant when you go through the hanging um, curtains and you push them aside. There'll be a drawing on that. It will 90% be Utamaro there and the work is so full of life so so extraordinary um hiroshige tends to do landscapes only and is 19th century died in 1858 100 years before i was born of a flu epidemic there are other artists uh, haranobu is fantastic and and hasui much later into the 20th century but those two artists kind of sum up for me and i and as you say i had the opportunity to make exhibitions of both of their work by borrowing works from the British Museum, along with Jonathan Watkins, the curator at the Icon Gallery. Another route into those two artists is Hergé. And when I was growing up, my greatest enjoyment, and this is pre-computer games, uh, obviously, it being the 60s, was Hergé's Tintin. Um, And I think I sort of learned both how to draw and also the love of drawing and also the understanding of drawing as a language 
not not just a, a, an exercise of trying to make something look realistic, but something that you can actually talk with, you can actually tell a story with. And I still love um, Tintin's books. I think that they are amazing. And he collected Japanese prints. Uh, and clearly, if you look at uh, where he was working from, look at the, the lotus, blue lotus, look at the, the the way that he draws, it's it's indebted to Hiroshige. Van Gogh famously copied Hiroshige. Van Gogh is my greatest hero. Van Gogh drawing has got to be the best drawing that one can possibly imagine. So that there's a kind of circle of, of connections there. I did go through a period where I bought everything I could possibly get my hands on. I've calmed down a little bit since then. I, I do have a lot of Hiroshige and I have a lot of Utamara. Um, I sort of moved on to looking at and buying manga cells. So when, when people make a, an animation, if you think of Studio Ghibli or something, um, back in those days, pre-computer animation, every single frame was drawn. And you can go to places in Japan where they are selling just boxes full of these individual cells on plastic, uh, hand-drawn, with, with the background as a separate layer. And it wasn't just the big Studio Ghibli ones, which are very expensive to buy. There are also just a lot of programs from the TV stuff from the 80s and so on, which are gorgeously drawn and, and also wonderful. And obviously highly indebted to, to the Japanese history of, of Ukiyo-e woodblock. Prince. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. The app offers access to over 30 cultural institutions through a single download, with new partners being added every month. As Julian says, he's made animations based on videos that he shoots, and one such animation, Galloping Horse from 2012, was shown at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park in the UK. Based in 500 acres of beautiful scenery not far from Wakefield and Leeds, Yorkshire Sculpture Park always has around 100 modern and contemporary sculptures on view. If you download Bloomberg Connects, you can explore all the works on display in the app's digital guide. Several artists who've worked with the centre discuss individual pieces in a series of audio and video clips called Perspectives, and those planning a visit can also take advantage of several curated routes around the park. For more content and to explore guides to all the partnering institutions, download Bloomberg Connects today. You can find the app at bloombergconnects.org. It's also available to download from the App Store and Google Play. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? I've recently come across Austronesian art, specifically sort of Indonesian, uh, specifically from Borneo and uh, Sulawesi. I came across it by chance completely, really. My main assistant's wife, her family comes originally from Sulawesi and they went there for their honeymoon and came back with some photographs. And I was like, as they say, what is that <laughs> in the background? Of, of this traditional village in the hills of, of Sulawesi were these amazing figures on the cliffs. So the tribe there, the Taraja tribe, they cut troughs into the cliffs that overlook the rice fields where they're working and they put effigies of, of their, their loved ones when they die up there, fully dressed, often with glasses, sometimes a wig. They would look quite realistic to a degree and there they stand and tens, twenties of them, um, and they stand like a football crowd, uh, leaning up against a railing, looking out over the fields. I've never been there. It's a dream to go there. COVID struck. I can't get there. You know, I'd really like to go and see this for myself because I think seeing things for yourself is so different. But they are amazing and they're, they're a little bit puppet-like. I don't much like puppets, actually, but they are admittedly a little puppet-like. They're a little bit like Egyptian figures. They're, they're made of wood, hard local iron wood. Um, the clothes have all rotted away, um, so so you're left with these these figures quite crudely jointed at, at the shoulders. And I found them very inspiring. I'm not quite sure what they will lead to. Maybe that hasn't quite happened yet. The Dayak tribe in Borneo, by contrast, is more I can't think of a sophisticated word. Scary. Their statues are more fierce. And the Sulawesi ones are, are cute. They have innocent look uh, their eyes are made of shell and they stare at you and they're quite innocent looking the the Dayak tribe um, from Borneo they're quite uh, intimidating looking characters although quite often small um, and they generally tend to have their hands spread like this in protection or supplication to the heavens and they look like tough 
people and they would have they as far as i understand they would have peopled the fields or the the long houses of the of the village something about the way they're so simply drawn think about the easter island statues they have perhaps something in common with that and that that culture of of people um did populate the the islands further out into the pacific they also went to madagascar bizarrely and were the first people to arrive in madagascar since they came from china and this is we're talking many many thousands of years ago it's pretty amazing that they they peopled all of these areas and yet the things that they make seem quite little known there's hardly any up in the british museum i went to have a look and even in the pitt rivers museum which used to be my favorite place to go when i was young they don't have any of these tau tau figures they're called the sort of wazy figures which basically i think just means man man tau tau but they they do have this very strong presence so that you're as aware as much as looking at them as statues as you are of your relationship human to human uh standing figure to standing figure and and perhaps if you come and see my exhibition i don't know i would fantasize i would i would hope that maybe some of that that sense of standing in front of and feeling some kind of connection and bounce back i do notice that when people look at my work and photograph their partner or themselves or their kids in front of it they'll quite often take up the same pose I don't know what that means, but it, there's something interesting going on there. Why? You know, they'll, they'll do the walking movement or they'll take up the same pose as the statue. So there's some, at least there's a connection there. Which writers or poets do you return to the most? I've bounced around and I'm quite confused. I've sort of st- stopped seeing books so much in terms of following an or a specific author and perhaps follow more like a genre for a bit. So I'll read sci-fi for a bit and try to get people to tell me what to read or I'll read detective stories for a bit. And at the moment, I've even given up on all of that and I'm only reading books about early humans. And I know that sounds pretty geeky, but I know the last book I picked up, it was it's a Kindle book. So you can, the, the trick with Kindle is you don't know how big the book is. And I've been reading this book for months. And I'm still only like 40% of the way through. You know, it tells you the percentage at the bottom. And I look at it in despair. I mean, I've got up to 6,000 BC, which is not bad, you know, <laughs> considering we started with Australopithecines, which were hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, so that's, I'm going to be reading that for quite a while. You, you talked about how that kind of reading around those sort of subjects influence your work. But I, I wonder if you're reading novels, do, is there any connection between a kind of fictional depiction of people and the fictional or the process of, of depicting people in art? Do you imagine around the characters that no, you depict? No, opposite. I don't want to make up anything. I don't want to fictionalise. At the moment, for instance, I'm trying to think, uh, you'll notice that all the people drawn in this exhibition are flat. In fact, everybody I draw is flat. They're nearly all, at the moment, cut out of a flat sheet of material. And I suddenly occurred to me, and this is partly through Egypt, looking at Egyptian art, which isn't always flat, despite common thoughts, what would it be if I twisted it? Um, this also came out of working with I-beams. You can sort of twist an I-beam at the point of bolting. The temptation, then, is to ask, I don't know, a dancer or at least a friend who's athletic to take up some twisted poses for me. And maybe I will, but what I really want to do is photograph the people in the park outside here and use the positions that everybody takes up when they're picnicking. Because I feel that those positions are much more interesting than the ones that I might invent. They are so telling, you know, people leaning on their elbow or they've got their arm thrown over their heads. They've got one foot on a knee. It's, you look at those positions and think, I know that, I know that position. That's, that's like, that's my aunt does that position or I can't do that position. Or they've, they've got a story, uh, but not in a made up one. They, they've got a kind of sense of realness. And, you know, I don't often do this, but if one was to go back and look at Raymond Carver, what I love about his short stories is that they, I don't know if they're made up or not. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about him, but they feel like they're more like memories, like of just a moment where he left the hotel room and noticed someone in the hall. That will be the entire short story. But somehow the way he tells it, that he evokes that sense of reality and presence. Uh, and it's that kind of feeling that I want to get to, rather than any kind of sense of, of inventing a character and, and putting that, bringing that person to life. I have no ability to do that whatsoever. I can only really draw what I see. Um, I can copy and I can draw what I see, which is not that far from copying. When I first started drawing, I used to look at myself in the mirror, close one eye, 
and draw on the mirror. And that way you step away, you've got a perfect drawing. And I kind of thought, well, that's so much easier. And you can do it in the, you know, anyone can do it. You do it in the shower with the, the, the mist on the glass. You can quickly draw your bathroom and you'll get all the perspective right. And it, that kind of drawing and that kind of reality interests me a lot more than trying to invent a bathroom. Which music or other audio do you listen to while you work? What I listen to while I work is generally very different from what I listen to for, I don't know, whatever you would listen to music for, let's say pleasure. I can't really listen to anything too engaging when I'm working. And I've noticed as I've gone through life that there's a particular kind of noise that is close to music and there's a particular kind of music that's close to noise and it interests me. And I don't think I know what to say much about it. But for instance, so picture yourself on a holiday and you're walking down a sandy path with palm trees around and you pass the spa in your holiday environment complex. And coming from the spa is this moody spa music. I can deal with that. I, I love that, that sense of atmosphere that's created by that music. And it's not too serious. It's not Buddhist singing bowls although I do listen to them as well. It's just sound, but cultivated, cultured sound. Lift music is close to that. Um, there's a French motorway uh, we take where there's a motorway stop. And in the lavatories, the walls are wallpapered with a forest and they play some kind of music mixed with bird song. And I could stay in there all day, <laughs> although, you know, you probably get dragged out <laughs> at one point, but... And that's the kind of thing that I play when I'm working. My family teases me that, that I play uh, rain sounds. I do have a rain sound CD. There's a whole radio station for people who can't sleep. One of my assistants listens to something, I can't remember what it's called, but it's some kind of tone that's played for like half an hour that's supposed to key in with something in, your, in a rhythm. And I, I kind of like listening to that too. In a way, and we could do this as an experiment right now, but it, since we're talking to microphones, it might not work. All you need to do is just stop and stay quiet and you can get all that for free because just listening to the sounds, unfortunately, I think what we can hear is the air conditioning, right? Which isn't the most interesting. <laughs> but it's the principle of ambient music that Brian Eno talked about. Yes. It's about incorporating the exterior sounds into your environment and it's what John Cage was talking about. And why course. not think of that as music? It can be just as beautiful and just as evocative but it's not purposeful. And Messiaen messed around with birdsong. So I've actually made quite a few pieces of music myself. My wife is a musician and we have a bit of a discussion about whether this is music. Okay, I don't really care about definitions. Let's say it isn't music, but I've made some soundtracks anyway. And I played them uh, in a museum show I made in Tokyo last year. One was a computer program that my clever assistant came up with that translates the sound of a blackbird into a piano note it's not i'm not the first person to do such a thing but what what maybe hasn't generally been done quite so much before was to make a, an algorithm from that so we took the various tweets of of the blackbird looked at that as a set of algorithms and um, took the notes and turned that into piano sounds and and ran it as a constant random algorithm that plays throughout the time that you're in the exhibition Part of my reason for doing that was that I noticed when I went to look at the museum that everybody was going around clicking their camera at the exhibition, not mine, the previous one. And it made this kind of constant sound, plus the click of high-heeled shoes. And I thought, that's, that's kind of interesting, but it's not very much to do with me. I didn't control that. I'd rather write my own soundtrack. So I did that with the Blackbirds, and I did some more. And I may well be, uh, you'll see if you come and see this exhibition at Pitsanger Manor in Ealing, whether I, I am thinking of maybe doing something similar here um, in order to, to people to animate the, the, the space, spaces here and to give a sense of atmosphere, which music can do like nothing else. But it won't be a piece of music. It'll be more like some kind of algorithm that will play constantly and be evocative. I have two choices as to that. One of them is not written by me. It's written by Max Richter, who you might have come across. Cool 
who since I've come across has become insanely famous. But at the point where he wasn't too famous, uh, he asked me to do a CD cover. And in return, I said, sure, but could you write me just a really short piece of music? And he did. And so I own this lovely piece of music by Max Richter, which I've used on, on, on occasion. And he's very much into this sense of moody, ambient, uh, no beginning, no end uh, sound. He wrote this sleep work, which has become very famous, particularly during the pandemic, um, which is beautiful and gorgeous. He, of course, is a great musician and is able to actually make something that's that's tuneful and beautiful and has melody. And uh, that's something I wouldn't even bother to try and do. But I but I can mess around with sound. So while I'm working, I tend to listen to these sounds. And if I can't be bothered to think too much, I simply look up spa sounds and put them on. Um, obviously, one of your most famous works of art is the cover that you did for the Blur album, a greatest hits record. And I wondered about how you feel about your visuals accompanying a very specific sound and a very highly known sound did, it, did that affect how you then designed that cover probably good no and no i really like being on cd covers when i was young there used to be lp covers they were great we spend all our saturdays flicking through uh, lp covers and i know them like i know an old friend you know roxy music covers or images burnt on my my retina david bowie pink floyd as much as any art i know those those images and i've always felt and increasingly that you know art doesn't only really i mean everybody knows this now anyway it doesn't just belong in museums and galleries there's so many other options for visual language don't you don't even need to call it art I, I love museums and I love galleries and they're great places to put up work. Here I've got like a team of people helping me. There's funding, there's white walls, it's clean. Um, people don't mess with the work. It's a great environment to set work up, but it's also exciting in a different way. I've got an artwork at the moment on Cork Street and another one on Carnaby Street and another one at Tower Hill. So you can do a little tour, actually. There's a map on my website. And all of these works can interact with the people walking past, with the perspective of Cork Street, with the busyness of Carnaby Street. And that, that's very exciting. But, you know, a CD cover or um, a shopping bag, some some of these these things have, have other kinds of lives and other kind of positions that one can make use of. So although, and I'm going to show off and name drop now, um, although the pictures on the front of the CD cover for Blur are also in the National Portrait Gallery, I first and foremost made that format of the four images as a square CD cover. Okay, yes, a little bit with the um, Beatles album, at least in my memory, if not in my forefront of, of my thinking. So that format, that square format and the use of the four people, the classic sort of number in a, in a pop group, did impose upon me. And I think, you know, that felt like in a positive way. But that was the way I was drawing. I was drawing a lot of people at that time. I didn't specifically invent that method of drawing, but it did, it did seem to fit. If you could live with just one work of art, what would it be? Sometimes, like most people who do anything public, you know, you think about Desert Island Discs and you think, how could you avoid only playing Bach? Or maybe you should, because in a way that kind of would do it. Might have to put in Handel's Messiah as well. But in terms of a picture, that's a tough one because in a way, art isn't really about that kind of relationship there is a kind of sense in which music kind of goes along with you through the decades and maybe that's also true to a certain degree with books but it's not the case with art I got a tiny Carl Andre made of magnets and I bought that actually I think in the 90s but you know one thinks of Carl Andre as as more 70s um, and, I, and I love looking at that and I don't make any kind of distinction in any sense that we're talking about between that and say a, a Peter Lely painting or a homo erectus hand tool or a gary gill or a xavier veillon sculpture there's a timelessness i suppose is what i'm saying um and and therefore in that sense there's a sense that you could you could come back to the same artwork again and again and not feel like you'd used it up or you've gotten just one time too many maybe a van gogh maybe a van gogh landscape 
not so much the cypress trees. I think I would veer away from one that was quite so famous, maybe just like a kind of fairly calm set of fields in Brittany, something like that. That would that would keep me going. If not that, maybe a Monet. Interesting that both of those are painted probably contemporaneously. I'm not, I'm not I would have thought roughly. Why does that spring to mind? There's something quite endless about that way of painting. It's endlessly deep. There's an endless amount of detail, however much you choose. You could zoom in with a, a lens further and further. You'd still keep zooming in. There's no point at which you've kind of passed the process of the work. Whereas with my work, you zoom in too far and you're left with a field of blue or whatever color you might have been zooming in on. I certainly wouldn't pick one of my works. I'd just end up trying to figure out what I did wrong or what I could do better. Um, but yeah, there are hundreds of other works I'd be happy to spend a lot of time with. And lastly, what's art for? <sighs> well, that's such a short question that it deserves a kind of short answer. It would be along the lines of for knowing that we're alive, for doing something about being alive, for communicating the fact that we're alive, for continuing to remind yourself that you exist. <sighs> that kind of thing. Julian, thank you very much. Thank you. Julian Opie is at Pitts Hanger Manor and Gallery in London from the 25th of June to the 24th of October. He also has public sculptures in the Plaza del Colegio del Patriarca in Valencia and in the University of Valencia's Lanao Cultural Centre until the 19th of September. An exhibition at the De Brock Gallery in Canocca, Belgium continues until the 15th of July and an exhibition opens at the Cristea Roberts Gallery in London on the 17th of September and continues until the 23rd of October. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And do also subscribe to our other podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, top shows and the key issues every Friday. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the art newspaper podcasts are Judy Mahalska and Amy Dawson. Thanks to Henrietta Bentle, Daniela Hathaway and Kabir. Jala. Huge thanks to Judy and Opie. Join us on Friday for the Week in Art and we'll be back next Wednesday with the next episode of A Brush With. Bye for now. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.